My name is Kelly Piacenti. I'm with Mass Mutual Insurance Company, and I head up a very special program called Special Care, which is a program that we help educate advisors across the country to work with special needs families. 86% of the people that work in this program and our financial advisors are special needs parents and or caregivers like myself, or they have maybe a sibling, but there's a reason that they want to work with families that are caring for someone with special needs. In addition to having over really close to 600 advisors, we have a couple that are on the spectrum and that have a job just like all the rest of us, and they're part of the program as well. So what I do is I make sure that the advisors are properly educated, they know what's going on in the special needs community, and they know how to deal with a family like mine, and they help plan for the future of an individual with a disability so that we don't forget them. Like years ago, we didn't plan for them, we didn't have a future for them. People live independently and we wanna make sure that when families are looking to take care of someone or make sure that they're okay, for the rest of their life, we give them that information. What, what moved you to do this? What was the primary stimulus? Well, you know what, I actually, I'm with Mass Mutual, but I came from MetLife Insurance Company. And as a person at an insurance company, we were advising people on how to get insurance. And anytime anyone had a special needs child, it was disinherit them or don't think about them, leave the money to somebody else. So a group of advisors that were special needs parents got together to the CEO and said, we have to think of a better way. We have to educate these families that these individuals are taken care of and maybe even better than the other individuals because they're gonna need it more for the rest of their life. So when I started probably about 20 years ago, um, it was because I was a special needs mom who was thrown into it. And um, I wanted to make sure that, and I'm not a salesperson, and I wanted to make sure that anyone that spoke to me or came to my family could understand what my family was going through. My son was nonverbal, and all he could do was smile, and we knew that he would need care for the rest of his life. So we wanted to ensure, and I wanted to ensure at my own company, that these individuals that were working with families like mine knew what we needed to do, knew about government benefits, knew about different therapies, knew about treatments, just knew about the family's life. So it started um, over you know, 20 years ago. And then five years ago, we merged our division with Mass Mutual. And I head up Mass Mutual's program for the same thing, helping families with special needs dependents. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, Perry, do you want to go next? Sure, great. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Perry LaRock. So I am uh, the founder and president of Mansfield Hall. Mansfield Hall is a residential college support program for students who are on the spectrum um, or students who just need additional services with social communication challenges, independent living skills, academics, um, vocational skills. Um, we have three locations currently. We're in Burlington, Vermont. We're in Madison, Wisconsin and Eugene, Oregon, all uh, great college towns. Um, I came to the work as a special education teacher and then as a special education professor um, and just saw this uh, huge need, um, uh, this huge gap in services between what colleges were able to provide our students and um, what options students had um, post, um, post secondary. So um, have enjoyed the work and uh, we've been around for about 10 years now and, and serve about 120 students and we have about 70 employees now. So uh, I'm Carolina, this is Paolo. Um, we are founding a company that we call Altitude here in Brazil. And I'm a psychologist and Paolo he is father of a child with autism. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> we met in the clinical environment, so I helped his son and then we started to think about the how uh, the world outside of the clinic is um, receiving this kid and this family outside, and we really think about of these children uh, in ten and fifteen years ahead, and we started to connect companies with this uh, people with autism to work a better place. So. Uh, 
to help the companies to understand that these people have special needs and they have like a life outside of their home. And also, uh, as uh, a, a project with uh, Dr. Allison, uh, we're studying a neuro, uh, neuro, neuro diversity uh, to help people with autism to work in the universities, um, bringing their point of view to resolve a problem. So this is, is our main goal, to connect people and companies with people with autism. Okay, wonderful. Bradley, do you want to say um, another hello? <laughs> hi, hi again, everybody. Yeah, so uh, Kennedy Krieger, it's really a, a, a lifespan mission. The, the, the whole motivation of, of taking excellent care from a medical standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint, from an educational standpoint, is not just to have a better the day after today, but an entire life of of uh, satisfying uh, existence that includes the dignity of work. So our, our uh, major thrust for the Institute is a post-secondary, set of post-secondary programs to prepare individuals um, with neurodiverse conditions to be ready to join the workforce and in tandem to help prepare the, the, the employers to understand what it, what it does and doesn't take to receive patient, uh, individuals with neurodiverse uh, diagnoses. So it's a bi we see it as a bi-directional role for us, uh, both for preparing individuals as well as preparing employers uh, and see it as part and parcel of a, of a lifespan philosophy to, to the mission of, a, of an institute that's focused on developmental disabilities. Hmm. So, uh, can, can anybody give me um, a kind of an overview of the shift, if there has been, which I assume there must have been, <clears throat> over time in, in the way in which the possibility of neurodiver neurodiversity is incorporated into the workplace and so on? I mean, I obviously see now the LinkedIn quotes that Richard Branson puts up about his company and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, but this all seems immensely recent, is that right? I, I think that the, my understanding is the origins go back about 25 years. One, one narrative is the origins go back about 25 years to Project Search, an idea that came out of uh, University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital, a, a mechanism to um, to basically have a transition to work program post-secondary for individuals with, uh, with autism and other neurodiverse uh, uh, diagnoses. And um, it started out locally and it has, I think it has spread virtually across the country. More than I think 45 states have project search programs, uh, 400 plus such programs around the country. We, we have one as well. I think it it may be it may feel relatively recent, but the origins of uh, the, the recognition I think go back a generation. From 20 years ago to now, even within our employers, we're seeing just a big difference when it comes to interviewing a person with IDD. I mean, they just the interview process that they had didn't fit for everyone, so they had to look at their interviewing skills and see that. You know, not everybody's going to be able to answer these questions. Not everybody's going to be able to sit here for an hour and, and come up with some of the answers that you're looking for. So they asked us and different people, you know, what questions should we ask? How can a person with a disability come in here and have the same opportunity as everyone else? So I'm seeing it across the country. I'm involved with a lot of nonprofits. I sit on nonprofit boards and the biggest struggle we're having as parents is, you know, employment, what happens next? The years of going to places that really didn't help the skills of these individuals is putting us being put aside. We have things in the state of New Jersey that if you're if you have a person that loves animals, we have a lot of farms that are looking for people to to really train them, not to just feed an animal, but really be the caregiver, take care of them, go to some of the shows with them. So really we're looking at what fits for the person. And employers are looking more closely that, you know, we've got to look out of the box. 
If you don't answer the question correctly, that shouldn't take you out of the running. We should look at the way we're asking the question. So I do see a change. I've seen that over the last couple of years, but it's coming. It's just coming really slow for some of us parents, and we're hoping to see it move more quickly. How do you prepare for somebody to, uh, at a company, to be able to be an appropriate and welcoming um, employer? I, I, the reason I'm thinking about this is that there's a whole number of things that have happened that have changed the, changed the culture, not only in the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter. And but there's, there's quite a few major companies that have programs. You, 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 people, people are somewhat scared of saying something wrong sometimes. Do you know what I mean? So Absolutely. Absolutely. But some of the bigger employers have a program that are for people with autism and they bring them in and they have a training program and then it doesn't end there. They want to get them into a job, but then they have mentors that make sure that they can be successful because what was happening is yes, everybody could employ someone with a disability, but what happens when they get there and they don't fit in, they were kind of lost. So I think that many of the companies move towards a type of program that you had a mentor that was going to help you, not just from day one, but maybe in day two or day or th year three or year four, and they continue to coach them and mentor them. We at my own company had you know, a few individuals that we were coaching and we were trying to help as well because it's not always easy, but just letting them come in is only one step. You really have to take it to a couple different levels to ensure that they're successful in that position. You know, I, I was hoping to jump in there, actually, because um, I, I think uh, Bradley said something <laughs> that uh, I thought was was interesting. Because I was thinking about what was what was I doing 25 years ago, and um, and I and being a lifelong educator, I think the the previous question you asked about why are we seeing this this larger increase now, and I agree with Bradley that that it has been uh, you know gone from a trickle to a much bigger um, flow over the past 25 years. But if you look at 25 years ago in education, the first concepts of mainstreaming and inclusion really came out. I mean, I, I was actually doing my undergrad degree in um, the mid nineties. And that was a time when you learned about what it meant to be inclusive in a school. And you learned what the word mainstreaming meant. I remember being on quizzes, what is mainstreaming? Whereas we've just taken those for, for granted at this point. Um, and so I think that part of the movement of the special education movement that I was part of, uh, I was trained at University of Wisconsin was how do we consider this idea of inclusion and how do we promote inclusion throughout someone's lifespan? And so I give a lot of credit actually to the education system of looking at individuals as learners and figuring out where they might best fit in the world. And I think one of the largest problems we're having right now serving students in college is the fact that students are being so well prepared um in the earlier schooling i mean we're starting to see students who are coming up to college who just have this expectation that they're going to be treated as an independent learner and that they're going to be able to seek the employment and and the classes and the coursework and the accommodations that they want um and so it's almost that that excellent amount of preparation that's happening in k through 12 um, but they're coming into college having those same expectations, but it, it drops down a little bit. You know, there's not the same level of support. There's not the same level of, um, you know, expectations around professors. And then we're even seeing a drop off of work even coming after that. So now we have students who say, you know, I, I really can't be in at work today because I'm having a mental health crisis where some employers are catching up to that and some employers are saying this isn't going to fit. So I see a lot of the inclusive nature of, of business and work. Um, stemming directly from this larger movement of making sure that people had self-determination or were able to um, sort of choose the paths that they wanted in life. I think we heard a comment earlier uh, uh, in, the, in the morning session about, um, about still uh, not having people with disabilities as part of, when you think about DEI and, and inclusion efforts, it's still frustratingly the case that uh, DEI initiatives, corporate, academic, you name it, do not have uh, individuals with disabilities front of mind. So I think we've made a lot of progress, just as Perry's saying. 
we have a ways to go that when you think about DEI per se, that disability is very much a part of it. So I'm, um, Dr. Baron Cohn mentioned 85% of people with autism and other IDD are, are, are unemployed. That, that's astonishing. That's, that's, a, that's a crisis. And it's especially a crisis uh, at a time when we have uh, workforce deficits. It's, it, there's, a, there's a disconnect here that is, um, is, is glaring and there's a real opportunity for us to uh, engage, helping people get prepared for work, helping employers recognize the great opportunity that's sitting right in front of them to employ people with uh, neurodiverse conditions or, or disabilities uh, uh, at this moment, but there still seems to be a, a, um, a gap in the, in the recognition and, and uh, front of mind nature of, uh, indiv for individuals with disabilities. So um, uh, the situation then, I mean, Carolina, um, altitude, um, the situation in Brazil, um and how how does your how does your um how does your company operate and what does it facilitate facilitate make easy what, what, what's the, what's the basic plan here uh well hearing all the um words uh here in brazil we're in the beginning of the beginning of this process um in, in the united states you have like already numbers of how many people with nervousity is unemployed. Here in Brazil, we started last year to have numbers of how much people with neurodiversity or autism we have in Brazil. It, it, it's really dark, uh, the scenario. So we are discovering everything. So um, we have a lot a few companies that have this initiative to employ people with autism. Uh, especially in the technology area. So, but it's only one company that we heard more like in the social media and making connections with these people because uh, I have a patient that he has uh, 18 years old starting going to the college and he doesn't know, he has autism and he doesn't know where to find uh, help with his disability. So our company is in a fresh start to make uh, first the companies understand that we have autism, that we have neuro neurodiversity and make first, um, we, we had a panel that we call your client is also a, a, a person with autism because we understand here in Brazil, if you, not even care about that people that can give you money to your company. How can you employ some, uh, have uh, and, uh, someone working with you? So it's amazing to hear that it works, uh, your project in the United States. So we can start in Brazil because we don't have a lot of initiative. So we're starting to connecting people to make the companies understand that they have to look to this person with disabilities and with uh, and that then can be benefit with the, the neurodiversity. So yeah. So what's the what's the is there a, are there any numbers on the on the size of the neurodiverse population in Brazil? No. no. So I, I can see that might be pretty uphill because you're, I, I assume that people would say to you, why? <laughs> I've, <laughs> yeah. There's already plenty of people here who are not neurodiverse who need a job as well. So, so yeah, and, and we need to explain that that people with the neurodiversity will be uh, 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 very good at, at that job. So yeah. we need to like to, well, uh, uh, let's hear about this. So they, and they doesn't want to. It's really hard. We we are like st starting to open space to discuss about this in this in, in the companies here in Brazil. Yeah. Um, 
One of the things that I noticed uh, at a conference I was listening to a couple of days ago <clears throat> uh, was that they had some CEOs on or, or, or certainly high placed uh, corporate executives who were also on the spectrum discovered it later in life. And they were pretty, they were pretty um, forthright in saying what advantages they had brought in terms of fast decision making, quickly seeing connections, and so on. Some of the stuff that's underpinned there in, in Simon Baron Cohen's book about systemic uh, thinking and so on and so forth. Um, but but to, to get that across to, uh, to, to an audience that doesn't necessarily understand it must be quite a task. So I wish you well. That sounds very difficult. Are you making progress? Yes, we are starting to talk with some companies. Um, we are starting with uh, some restaurants here. They are more opening to this conversation. So we are starting with small business to then reach the big one. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Perry, do you, could you want to just pick up on that point that I was just making? Um, about the uh, the fact that there are quite there are some some quite a number of, of well placed executives who in fact discovered rather late that they were in fact somewhere on the spectrum um, and um, were you know quite vocal and, and and persuasive and quite clear about the fact that they that they they brought certain capacities and skills to their corporations. Um, yeah, I, are, those, are those the sorts of things that you are there for identifying and looking for and seeking to enhance in the schooling, in the pedagogical process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always get a little worried. Um, I mean, someone who is a CEO, uh, who is um, very successful, who you might not otherwise know is on the spectrum, um, that is now coming out and saying, you know, I have, I think it's great for the community. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think it does us a lot of favors to um, assume that there's going to be other CEOs in the works that are going to have the same kind of characteristics that are going to make them capable of being a CEO someday. Um, you know, for us, oftentimes it's trying to match a student's interest with what is actually could be a meaningful career. And I think that that is um, the art in the work. Um, you know, we might have a student who absolutely loves history, uh, but has, you know, very poor social skills to become a professor or um, doesn't have an interest in, in being in writing. And so how do you meet this need of someone's desire, you know, to be a historian um, and match them with something where they can actually put food on the table? Um, it gets a little trickier than that. And I, and I see that with, um, uh, a lot of different of our a lot of our students you know we're trying to take someone saying here's what you here's what you want in life and what can we do to meet those desires that self-determination piece of, of of who you are with what's actually out there and um one of the areas we run into and and i'm you know sitting between the 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 world of business and and um you know primary schooling um is really for us to try to figure out um what is it that that student wants to do that corporations are offering? I mean, it's great when we see different corporations saying, oh, I heard people with autism are really good at coding. We have coding jobs available. You know, of our students, we maybe have 25, 30% of them who are good coders, but they don't all want to code. <laughs> you know, uh, they don't want to work in banking. I mean, there is some, you know, as Temple Grandin said, if, you meet, if you've met someone with autism, you've met some one person with autism. Um, and I think that that's where we struggle just trying to figure out the reality of we have these students with all these different wonderful characteristics that could make them great at a lot of different things. It doesn't mean that they're going to be a CEO someday, but trying to figure out how they can have a meaningful career with the things that they actually want. And, and just to back up a, a little bit to the project search piece, I, I feel like one area of discrimination that we've seen, and, and I, Bradley, I really appreciate bringing this up, is, you know, the, the, the discriminate one, 20% of students with disabilities who start college finish, which means 80% of students who, with disabilities who start college fail. Um, and so there's huge amounts of discrimination in the post-secondary education. And in some ways, I think the, 
the thought back in the day was, well, let's go from high school to getting a job. Let's just get people trained. And that led to earlier sheltered workshops in the 70s and 80s. Um, so how do we transition someone to, if they have a desire to go to college and have advanced training, how do we get them through a system who's actually trying to weed them out in many ways? Um, and then also get them onto the career path that they want to be on. And so there's a lot of um, bumps in the road of trying to figure those pieces out. I mean, we're doing our best right now as an educational organization, um, you know, some work with Joe Riddle, um, with Autism at Work and some other folks in, in the industry. We just started a program at Mansfield Hall with Herzing University to try to get students who are interested in the tech field um, to have that uh, a more supported path to get there. Um, but how, how we're actually taking those students who are from the educational side to finding them meaningful careers, not just places where they can cash a check. There's a question from Jeff Snyder here <clears throat> for, um, uh, about Brazil, um, for Carolina. Um, Jeff uh, is, is a member of the ATPF community, by the way, those who don't know him and, um, writes a blog, uh, all sorts of things, very, very active on LinkedIn as well. So <clears throat> but his question was, um, Carolina Yoshida, um, does Brazil have vocational programs <clears throat> that neurodiverse individuals can go and learn, <clears throat> excuse me, job skills the same way as in the United States? <clears throat> Does Brazil have vocational programs that neurodiverse individuals can go and learn job skills, where they can go and learn job skills the same way as in the United States? Mm, yes, but they are private, so it's not a public service. So here in Brazil, uh, since the child uh, going to an intervention, uh, early intervention, uh, if they don't have money, they will have a, a lot of trouble and struggling to get a, a good um, follow-up of the development. So we have, uh, I, I make contact with one company, uh, one center that make this vocational uh, job with this people with neuro neurodiversity, but it's private. So it's just one that we heard. So we, we don't have a lot. Wow. Okay. So I mean, this is <clears throat> Kelly, um, any thoughts on this, um, about vocational, um, uh, programs here, obviously. Not. I, I mean, I, I agree with all the panelists. They've come a long ways. Um, years ago, what we were training them for really wasn't very helpful. We had a lot of people that had a lot of talents that we didn't tap into. We have individuals, and I was listening to some of the sessions before that, you know, what does the person like to do? And to Perry's point, I mean, you can't all be CEOs, but maybe we can find positions that actually make them happy. I think that in the financial industry, we're seeing that people are great with numbers but once again, you have to go out and you have to sit and you have to talk to people face to face. Maybe that's not their niche, but financially they're fantastic. And maybe there's another role that they can play. So I think that, you know, the employers are waking up to it. I agree. We talk about discrimination. We talk about groups that are not treated fairly. This particular group has not ever come to the top. So, I mean, there are so many positions available and there are so many people with disabilities that could fill those positions, but we don't have people willing to take a chance. So I think that the skills that they're receiving, the, the colleges, the universities, the programs, they're getting the skills. It's working with employers. For example, Walgreens is an employer that you know, has gone completely towards hiring people with disabilities. They have a facility in Connecticut that every person with a disability that works in this facility, which is 90% of their employees, there are you know, different ways to communicate with them. If they're not able to read, there's signs and there's pictures and there's things for them to do. So they try to find positions for people that make them happy. It's not just putting them on a line or making them put buttons in a bottle. Those days are long gone. So I think if we can get the employers, there's a lot of different employers out there signing on, saying we're gonna help people with disabilities. 
we're going to hire people with disabilities. I think that they need to have a program within their company because they can hire them, but they've got to retain them. And that's the problem. So, I mean, it's great to hear, you know, that Brazil is getting there, but it's sad. I mean, that, you know, there's not that many opportunities for people abroad. So we as the United States are setting the path, but on the other hand, we need to do better with our employers and we need to make them aware that just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you're not a good employer. What we find with people with disabilities are, they are the better employees. They show up, they don't complain, they do their job, they don't bother anybody. So that's, you know, as an employer, that's great that they just wanna do their work. And, you know, when we have others that don't show up for all kinds of reasons, we have people that have IDD that never miss a day of work. So we've got to, you know, get that message out to these employers to consider hiring individuals with disabilities because I don't think that they will be disappointed. Yeah. So, so could you speak as well? I mean, there's there is these kind of almost quasi-academic points that are being raised all over the place right now. I was reading a piece yesterday. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but it was talking about ableism as opposed to being disabled and whether that is an appropriate word to use and so on. And I, I this was new to me. I hadn't, I hadn't read that kind of level of discourse on using this word ableism. I mean, you must be engaging with it, you know, finding these things as, as you go into it now, or you must have to develop a, a, your own philosophical position on these sorts of things, I assume. Yeah. It's every day. I mean, people first language is, is big. Um, we have some that use it, some that don't. And there are different words that are not even, you know, families don't like it. They don't like when you say special needs or disability. I mean, it depends on the person, but they are going back and forth with certain words that are offensive in this community as well. And I'm sure that Perry and Bradley could talk to you about that as well, but we're seeing it every day. I approve all the communications for special needs for my company. And there are certain words that certain organizations don't want you to use. So we need to take it out of the literature, but that can change on a daily basis, to be honest with you. Uh, the, the discrepancy in employment is, is essentially structural uh, and institutional ableism. It, 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 there's, no, there's no other really good explanation for why individuals with disabilities, I don't, we're, we're talking, this is an autism focused conference. So we're, we're talking about autism, but I'm, I'm broadening it to neurodiversity and disability. There's no good explanation other than sort of, I would say structural and institutional ableism. Kelly made this point about, um, about uh, non-disabled em employees. You, the, that I, we make this point all the time to employers who are wondering how all the accommodations they think they're that they think they're going to have to make. And we say, just ask your HR professionals what they deal with with just the uh, so let's say the garden variety employee and all that they have to go through. Uh, you'll you'll be refreshed uh, in your experience by um, by broadening your your hiring practice and and embracing. Uh, neurodiverse and, and disabled individuals into your workplace, it'll be refreshing. Uh, and, and those that have gone down, have taken the steps down that journey, come back and say, yes, that has been the experience. There are these even intangible consequences of uh, creating a, a neurodiverse workforce that uh, benefits the people that are there who uh, haven't previously um, engaged in this way. And it's hard to quantify that, but it's that's valuable as well. So, um, Kelly, the, the point just really resonated with me. That that has been our experience as we've been making the case to to employers. Yeah, absolutely. And my employees that have a disability, I have to say, are the better employees. I I would be dishonest if I wasn't saying that. They don't complain. They don't carry on about the same things. They move on. Maybe they need you know, some more guidance. Maybe they need you to speak to them a little differently or go over something once or twice. But I agree with you, Bradley. They think accommodations are, you're gonna to have to redo the building. You know what, you should be up on 80. You should be, you should have those accommodations anyways. We shouldn't be having to ask you for them. And we're not asking you to rebuild ramps or do anything. We're just asking you to take into consideration what they might need 
to be employed there. And, you know, what I've seen is that most of them don't need accommodations. It's more, they need someone there to go to or ask those questions to, because they are the person that does show up every day. I think that point about the, um, I knew right where you're going with that, Bradley, the, the uh, systemic ableism. I, I think that uh, we've got to get that, that out there because there's such a talk about systemic racism at the moment. I mean, if you look at universities, they are structurally ableist. I mean, that that is the concept behind a university. I mean, they're actually rewarding ability. Um, and so we face this problem daily. And there's an idea, I, I, and it's unfortunate, I think that um, pedagogically, people think that becoming smarter is about something becoming more vigorous and um, and more rigorous. And I think that the problem is is that oftentimes it means that you've enhanced or you've um, broadened someone's ability in college. And so oftentimes people think, well, if it's e you know having something be that has more accommodations or allows people to express their ideas in multiple ways is easier rather than it's uh, a way for people to be able to um, express themselves uh, in a way that allows, um, you know, for them to be understood. And when we have colleges who are, and I always think it's funny, if you look at the, um, the you know, what is it, the, the college rankings, right? They, they usually give about three different statistics about how they decided which colleges were ranked the highest. And one of those is the acceptance rate. And, and the crazy idea here is that the lower the acceptance rate you have for a college, meaning the more people you reject, the better of the college you are. And I think that just rethinking about what colleges are there for, I mean, should they be serving students who have a desire to learn, who students who fit the curriculum that they're seeking, that have the kind of degree paths that they want, and then are we able to evaluate those students for their ability to contribute in that field rather than um, their skills that they've demonstrated thus far through assessments that are structurally ableist and um you know it just goes right down the chain all the way up into, into into job placement so i appreciated you bringing that up um we battle with that every step of the way and i could give you a million different examples right down to the number of credits you're taking per semester generally gives you priority to certain things in a college um you know so if you're taking nine credits because you have a disability that might mean that you are the last person to register for courses the next semester um all of those little pieces that are just hidden in there that greatly impact someone with a disability um you know are, are really damaging to their ability to be successful in college it does seem to be um i i'd like to explore this point a little bit more bradley what do you what does this work what just just um because it, it intrigued me not really having thought about it much in that sense. What does this word ableist mean to you? It, I mean, it, it basically means that um, people with disabilities have a, uh, are, are less, I think, um, uh, as I think the Temple Grandin quote, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not less. But ableism basically is a, a way of um, projecting that individuals with disabilities are less. Ableism promotes the lack of disability as, a, as the natural and full human state. And if you have a disability, you are less than that. And that's a concept that, well, we should wholeheartedly and vigorously reject uh, when, when it surfaces, whether it's implicit or explicit, we need to, to draw attention to it as a, a concept that needs to be rejected. Um, I think there is a, a great deal of implicit ableism, like, like many of the isms. To some extent, there is explicit. I think uh, Perry laid out some examples where it's codified even uh, in an academic setting, for example. But implicit ableism, uh, is, uh, I, I think, a, a, uh, a common part of the, the human experience for people with disabilities. And how general do you, do you think this, this is? Do you think this is the, 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 the level of discourse in Europe as well, in UK? I mean, or is this just um, a, a, an American universities thing that, you know, I'm not, I'm not being funny, I'm just asking. Oh, I know, I know. I, I mean, I, uh, I just don't know. I think that um, just to be straightforward, I think that uh, eugenics is a response, 
is a uh, pro-ableist uh, worldview. And uh, the, the idea that there are people who are less than and uh, those that are greater than and based on a perceived ability. So I don't think it's, it's a academic, it might be a academic construct in the sense that it's not as widely recognized as an ism as others like sexism and racism, but I don't think it's, it's something that's uh, culturally endemic to the United States. I think it's a pervasive uh, part of the challenges in, 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 in society. Not to be overly uh, general, uh, you know, uh, broad in the statement, but I think it is a pervasive issue. So does, does this, this stuff that I talked about, Simon, earlier, um, which I, I, I think is just really important, I, it, it's, um, it might be depressing for a moment or two, but I don't think so. As I said before, the, the, the quintessential go-to go point at this, uh, this moment is the genetic lottery, which is Catherine Page Harden's book, A New Moral Framework for Genetics, and which deals with eugenics, but moved forward to now and says, are we doing that? Are we doing eugenics or, or might we want to? Um, how, might it be an idea to improve you know, to do have gene genies. You want uh, you want your child to be a great musician, uh, a wonderful poet, uh, a novelist, a great athlete. We got the genes for you, honey. I mean, we can we can do gene genies on you there. So, not necessarily a great idea, um, but it seems to be a, a dialogue that is now restarted. And please explain. Well, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's it's interesting that you bring that up because I think one of um, the most interesting, difficult questions right now is: should we cure Down syndrome? Right. Um, I, I, we we certainly, if you want to think about Down syndrome as uh, one of the ongoing aspects of eugenics right now, um, it is one of the most screened for um, disabilities in uh, during early stages of pregnancy, um, and um, we know that with some genetic work, we can actually probably eliminate Down syndrome. And, um, and there are people, you know, a, a huge part of our population who have Down syndrome, who are wonderful contributors to our society. And the question really becomes, uh, if there's that many people out there with Down syndrome, is it really a quote unquote mutation? Or is it just a natural part of, um, of, of, of our human being? And, um, and, and certainly, um, I think that that goes back to sort of why the original phrase of cure autism went away and we started, I believe they became Autism Speaks um, because are we out here to cure disabilities or are we out here to make sure that disability is part of the, the world fabric? I'm adding world because Brazil is here, but uh, part of the United States fabric of, you know, someone with a disability should be just as included and just as thought of and just as in, uh, empowered as somebody without a disability. Um, and how important it is it is it for? Um, I, I thought it was humorous. My my nieces are much younger than I am, uh, and um, you know we I was asking them about um, uh, autism and, and disability, and for them they didn't grow up in a world where special education was a place. They grew up in a world where special education was a set of services, and those services happened in the classroom. And we're trying to now, um, you know square that away with a world who expects somebody with a disability to still be hidden away with a new generation of people coming up who have worked alongside and studied alongside and played alongside um, students with disabilities has become more of a part of their own fabric. And so how do we continue to, to welcome that rather than try to remedy it? Right. There is a question here from Louisa Lurkus, which says, are there incentives offered to companies to train staff and hire more neurodiverse employees? Just a large question, Kelly, you would have the answer to that. I don't think there is an incentive, a financial incentive. I think it's trying to get them to do the right thing. That's more so what I think it is, but I don't believe there's an incentive. There are organizations that are national organizations, Disability in and a few others that are really going after CEOs and telling them, come on, get on board with this. We have people in our organization that 
by trying to place individuals with disabilities in jobs and they want to work in companies. They don't want to work in sheltered workshops. Those are long gone. So the incentive is it's the right thing to do. And if you, you know, research it, you will see that there are many large companies that are doing it. Walgreens does it, CVS does it, Google does it, Facebook does it. There are many companies that are hiring people with disabilities and have programs for them within the company. You're just not hearing a lot about it, but if you're in a particular state, there are many companies that are, have jumped on. Raytheon jumped on years ago. There are many companies that are trying to do it. Do they all hire everybody with disabilities? I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the other question. They have the programs. I think, you know, Perry's probably more involved in it, seeing, you know, students that are graduating from his program. But I do know that there are programs out there with certain companies for sure. So what's the typical um, 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 outcome of your cl the classes, uh, Perry, at, at, at Mansfield? I mean, what, 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 do you follow them, oh. follow up with them and see wh where they went, what happened? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question to brag a little bit. <laughs> um, so we, um, so right now we're seeing, we, we do our follow-up study. So most students only stay with us for about, uh, on average, about a year and a half, two years. And so our job is to become as um, least, rele least relevant in their life as, as possible so that they're actually able to go on to college um, and access the services, um, which I think is really what we're trying to train them for. Colleges have great services. No one knows how to use them. Um, I actually published a book last year called Taking Flight, where the whole point of the book was to try to demystify what a college looks like and how students with disabilities can succeed within it. The idea there is that colleges have a lot of different opportunities for students to be supported and successful. It's just that if you don't know how to ride that bike, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. And so how do you do that? So right now, like I said, that there's about 20% of students who start college um, with disabilities finished, which is just horrific. We're seeing about 70% of our students um, when we do follow-up studies um, either are close to or have finished um, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And so we are seeing a large number of students with that additional level of support be able to get through college. A lot of it is around coaching. I mean, our model is one part academics. I mean, we, our model is we're a holistic program. We say we have learning, living, giving, and engaging. So we have the academic piece, but then we give back independent living support. Um, we give um, social support, and then we also give um, vocational support in the area of volunteering, providing internships, requiring all of our students to volunteer, um, and having goal setting in all those different areas. Um, rarely do we find a student who's struggling in a class is because of the content. It's generally because of everything else in their life is right. not, you know, not allowing them to, to be present and focused in the class. I mean, we're seeing the exact same thing. I was having a conversation with um, some business owners recently where um, they were frustrated that some of the, the pieces they put into place, you know, the low stimulation rooms or the different policies they put in place on a corporate side. Um, aren't necessarily paying off to higher results for students with autism. Well, that's because getting to work, getting out of bed in, in the morning, being able to solve problems, not isolating, having a, a robust social life outside of, of work is as important to maintain what they're doing at work as the room that they can go to to have some quiet space. So I, I see it going sort of um, twofold there. Hmm. So um, Brazil, tell me a little bit more about Brazil in terms of whether there's anything like this sort of thing. Uh, I, I'm talking about Carolina now. A anything like this here, or um, are, you, are you still quite away from being able to deal with this whole notion of the education system? Uh, um, answering the question that Kelly answered, um, okay. here in Brazil, uh, going back to, uh, I, I was talking with Paulo because here in Brazil, we don't have the voca vocational uh, center to help these people, but the government, uh, they have uh, like a discount in tax for the companies who hire uh, people with deficiency, but they don't, don't talk about deficiency. They, they, they only talk about, they only hire people with uh, physical disabilities. They don't think about the neurodiversity. 
it, it, it's funny, but it's also sad because it, it, it doesn't work for everything. They only only think about, oh, I want some discount, so I will hire something, someone who has, it, it, it's not like a, uh, a really big disability. They, they, they like to shortcut to like, oh, you don't have like one finger, so you get in and you don't, I don't have to adapt anything in my company to bring you to work yeah. with me. Is, is, yeah. this, is this because the, the sheer diagnostic process of something as complex as that would yes. be too difficult? They, they, everything, everybody who has a, a diagnosis like human back, so you, you don't have like to uh, distinguish, distinct? awesome. yeah, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have quote, quote, how can I say in English, quotes to join the university as well. So they have this program, but they, 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 they don't offer any help in like in a follow up with the with psychologies or occupational therapies or speech therapies. They, they don't just throw in, in the university and you have to do everything by yourself. So you have this, this kind of initiative, so, but you don't have the follow-up. So you don't have any, any, anyone to help these people when they start the university or even in, in the kindergarten. Uh, I need to go to the school and, and, and explain to them too. So this is my client, this is my patient and you need to work with him this way, that way, and everything. So you you really need to help people set up yeah. organizations, small organizations that at universities and other places and, and corporate that can actually take on this responsibility of being a bit more thoughtful and, and, and seeing further than just a tax refund. Yeah. Uh, they they start to modificate the the environment and everything just when they uh, have the children with uh, some disabilities. They don't think like before. They just think after. So Paulo had this trouble with his son. He 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 got a lot of negatives to put his son in the school. So oh we have all this. Oh sorry we don't have like for him, something like that. They, they, they make it, uh, 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 an excuse for not so, accepting. Uh, did, did, did I asked you before, I think I asked you before, but I mean, you, you, you didn't know what the percentage, the proportion of um, neurodiverse population is in Brazil, do you? Yeah, you have the disabilities, but the, like autism, we don't have like a... a, a, a a right number, so it, it, you have like percentage, but you don't have much. It, it's starting now because all the moms and the fathers are starting to say, uh -huh. we need to count these people. We need to know where they are. We need to know who they are and everything. So this is what we want to help with our project too. So help they understand that people, these people exist, the, the neurodiversity exists, and we need to know that and the, connect to them. Um, that's, that's been very informative, at least for me. Thank you very much for all your uh, information and, and comments and, and, and for your doing what you do. Mm -hmm.